Welcome to World of Marketing Podcast, a Foster Web Marketing production. Here's your host, Tom Foster. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the World of Marketing, where I talk to industry leaders about marketing mindset and business growth. This episode is brought to you by my own company, Foster Web Marketing. Foster Web Marketing is dedicated to providing cutting-edge, highly customizable websites, marketing, video, and strategic solutions specifically designed for law firms, medical practices, and other professional service businesses. Our award-winning web technology marketing system sets us apart from everyone else. Please visit our website at Foster Web Marketing if you want to know more. But today is all about Jim Henninger is the rebrand man. He leads the efforts of the rebranding experts, which he founded in 2017 after 30 years of business and brand strategy experience for P&G, McDonald's, Anheuser-Busch, and others. Jim, welcome to my podcast, and thank you so much for being here, brother. Hi, Tom. Thanks for the warm welcome. Yeah. So tell me, how did you get into this rebranding business, and what is rebranding? Because like I told you when we got started, I was like, what is rebranding? Well, let, let's start with that. Um, yeah. You know, so I, I, I think it's always good to kind of, you know, make sure everybody has a, a common view of what branding and rebranding is. So your brand is that it's not just your logo. It's not just your name. It's that collection of experiences and product interactions or company interactions and associations that a customer of a product has in their minds relative to who you are. And it's meant to be a shortcut to help them make decisions to choose you over competitors as quickly as possible. So that's what a brand is. And branding is all about then differentiating yourself from your competitors so that your brand helps kind of clearly articulate what makes you different, what makes you better, what makes you the desired partner versus everyone else that's out in the marketplace. Because it's all about making that quick decision in the customer's mind. So with that as backdrop, then rebranding is standing up an entirely new brand for your company or for your product to help make that decision even easier. It means, you know, modernizing your brand. It means coming up with a brand that's much more relevant uh, to customers today and into the future and increasing that kind of bond with your customers in ways that you never have in the past. And it's interesting because you know, we'll often say to people, they'll, they'll come to us and say, we want to rename our organization. And I'll kind of stop for a second and pause and be patient and say, well, tell me about your brand. What is your brand doing for you? Is it working hard for you uh, in, in, in differentiating you from your, um, your competition? And they'll be like, well, wh what do you mean by my brand? And I said, well, let's start there because you don't want to just rename your organization. You want to rebrand it. You want to build a whole association that customers are drawn to um, emotionally. So let's let's build a new brand, and part of that new brand will be a new name for the company. Yeah, it's interesting because like there's been success and failures with this. The biggest one that comes to mind is New Coke, right? Yeah. New Coke, right. That was everybody a big knows fail. that one. Well, it was interesting because they they used it as an opportunity to change their formula. So so whether it was intentional or not is a good question. Right. And then they went back to the old formula and then they but actually it it actually worked out for them because the, it ended up, um, I don't know, bolstering the 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 old brand. You know, now now we're let's now we got old Coke back, folks. But was it really old Coke in the first place, you know, or is it just another another uh, version of Coke? You know, who yeah. knows? You know, one of probably one of the most familiar rebrandings that's happened in the last year or so that most average people, you know, have have experienced is is Facebook and this introduction of Meta. Right. Um, yeah, OK. And they didn't they didn't really rebrand Facebook. They left Facebook alone, but they they created a new corporate structure and called it Meta, and that allowed them to go off and pursue all the new uh, virtual reality kind of opportunities and businesses and so forth. 
and didn't have to bring the baggage that Facebook has in a lot of people's minds along with them into that new universe that they're trying to create. But that's one when, when people say, you know, tell me about a rebranding. Most people know about the introduction of Meta. I guess that, but to me, that's like a new brand. Correct. Yep. Yeah. It was so, called a rebranding, but it's actually, it was the introduction of a new brand. You know, in your bio, you got McDonald's. So you worked with McDonald's and it's funny. I was sitting in McDonald's the other day. I shouldn't even confess that because I love McDonald's. Oh yeah. And I'm sitting in there and I'm having my double bacon quarter pounder with cheese and loving it. And my mocha frappe. And uh, I'm looking around and I'm thinking, man, this place looks great. And the man, the, the workers in there are just being so nice and polite. And I'm thinking, and this is a McDonald's in my neighborhood that I have been to who knows how many times in my lifetime. And, and how many versions of that McDonald's and it just refreshes constantly. Right. And, and I was like, how do they know when to refresh, how to refresh and what to refresh to? You know what I mean? Like, how does, how do you know that? A lot of research and customer insight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you And you raise a really good um, uh, question there is, is because we will we'll oftentimes break out what's the difference between a brand refresh and a repositioning and then a rebrand in its entirety. Um, because companies all the time are refreshing their brands. They're updating, they're modernizing, they're putting a, you know, a fresher look on whether it's their packaging or their logo or their restaurants in the case of McDonald's. That happens all the time. And that's the responsibility of good marketers to to know when the time is right to do that. Then you've got companies that are repositioning themselves. Great examples in the retail environment lately are um, Abercrombie and Fitch right. and Victoria's Secret, who, you know, the imagery they were using and the market that they were trying to sell to, we grew beyond it as a society and it just didn't fit anymore. It was kind of awkward feeling. Women weren't having the Victoria's Secret fashion, you know, shows and and the you know the angel models anymore. So they had to reposition themselves and offer products that met to a more inclusive group of customers. Then you get companies that rebrand, that change the the entire brand itself, that change the name of the organization, the promise to the customer. They look at creating a different culture because they really want to dramatically pursue a new growth strategy that the old brand was not going to allow them to do. Uh, one that's real recent is um, Elevance Health. So this is a Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance product provider kind of Midwest and Eastern part of the country. It went for years as Anthem. They decided that they wanted to move beyond just an insurance provider and be kind of a total health partner to their customers and be able to to offer a more inclusive and broader packages of services and that they needed to change their brand to be able to do that. So they introduced Elevance Health, which was a combination of Elevate and Advance merged together. And it, it allows them to tell a whole new story to their customers about how they can help them achieve their kind of personal health goals. I thought you were saying elephants the whole time. <laughs> Elevance. So got, it, be. got it now. <laughs> But I'm sure a lot of people get that elephant. What? Okay. <laughs> All right. So most of the people that listen to this podcast are lawyers and doctors. So branding for a law firm, that's tricky, you know, because it's based on and, you know, we we're just talking. Your daughter works for works with a law firm. So what what is your what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's interesting. I think law firms, you see that the, the names of founders or partners being a very common naming yep. technique. Um, and that for many, many decades was the way that you drew people to your firm was because of the what the power of that name stood for. 
what what I've seen in the dental community lately is this less about the name and more about the practice and going to things like bright smiles or dynamic smiles and things that talked more to the outcome of the relationship with that practice for the customer or the patient than about the doctors who work there, the, the dentists that work there. So I think you, there's a, you're immediately starting to see how branding is, is taking a different route within the dental practice community than even in the law community. One of the big challenges that you're always going to face is if your if your you know your your business your practice is named after an individual, what if that individual doesn't play a big role anymore? Um, right. Maybe they're deceased. Maybe you know there's no one left with that name. Right. You have to have such a strong association with that name and that name meaning something to prospective clients that it's worth continuing to hang on to. So I, I think it's going to be tough in the legal community to talk about the outcomes of working with us, as in, you know, dismissing the lawsuit or winning the lawsuit or winning the, you know, that's going to be a little bit more awkward than coming up with like bright smiles for the dental community. So I'm not really sure exactly it's a, how. It's a big challenge. Yeah. And it's funny. It's And I, I mentioned to you right before we uh, hit record that, uh, one of my great friends and uh, one of our, our our biggest client, Hubie and Abraham, up there in in uh, in Milwaukee, and they're in three states. But uh, they're a billion dollar uh, firm. They're the biggest firm in the Midwest, personal injury firm, and uh, they have a fantastic brand. William Shatner is, uh, does their commercials, and Jason Abraham is a master of of a branding uh for the for the firm and has done that fantastic job with it he has a podcast too called tell them you mean business and you should get on that podcast but anyway when we talk about that you know like how do you keep it fresh and really you know what they do what jason does is jason's a giver you know, and uh, a big thing about what he does is he just gives back to the communities that they're in. I mean, he's constantly doing that. You know, as much as, you know, people know, like, sure, lawyers make, they make a lot of money. Uh, they, they're a contingency, but, but this law firm, specifically Jason Abraham, they give so much back to the community. It's it's amazing. And that is a, a, a way to brand, I believe. Do you oh, agree certainly. with that? Yeah. Oh, certainly. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, it's 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 being that supportive community member, which in in many cases is a is a great branding strategy. I think, you know, when you go to some of the the massive law firms, um, you know, that are even global these days, they're spending a lot of time trying to because um, the part, you know, the original namesakes may not be involved with the organization anymore. They're trying to create right. kind of thought leadership for like Johnny Cochran. You know, yeah, and, you know, that's they, a great example. The Johnny Cochran, the Cochran Law Firm, they still use his name and they still do that stuff. And um, that's exactly where you're. That's a, a great example. Yeah. So you have to build a the next level of leadership exposure for them and what they're right. kind of their expertises and thought leadership, you know, so that the people see beyond a name where somebody might not be living that name anymore. They see all sorts of great talent underneath it. And ultimately what people want is just a great lawyer. That's going to get them out of their troubles. Responsiveness. Get them what yep. For. yep. So Jim, let's, how did you get started in this business? Yeah, good question. So right. I spent about 25 years in the the global PR agency environment, working with Anheuser Busch and Procter and Gamble and Wendy's and so forth. And then I went to McDonald's Corporation as a as a kind of a consultant to their leadership on some major issues that they were going through that needed not only communications but kind of change management support. Coming out of that, I wanted to get back into the agency world, and they said start your own agency and we'll continue to do work with you and get you off the ground and help, you know, fuel your growth here. And I really wanted to do something that was a kind of a tighter niche that brought together 
a broader perspective of all the background I had, not only the communications and the corporate reputation, but the branding, the change management, um, the human resources kind of element, employee engagement and so forth. And rebranding was the was the opportunity to do that because it's such a broader requirement than just coming up with a new name or a new logo or, you know, how am I going to go out and market this? It's changing the organization to support that new brand. And that was the perfect mix of all the kind of capabilities that I had gained working with some of these great clients over the years. So we launched Rebranding Experts uh, in 2017, and it really is, you know, we're the only folks that that look at it as how do you make your rebranding successful? Not just what is that new brand going to be, but how am I going to get my leadership aligned behind it, my employees engaged and supportive of it, my all the back office functions updated and ready to go to support this new brand? And then how do I captivate my customers with the new story that we're trying to tell, make it as you know least of a disruption as possible to them so that we can start to you know really get ourselves on a much more um, a strategic growth you know kind of path than we have in the past. So it's been a great journey to be able to do that. Very good. So can you walk me through your process? Yeah. We had to put together the playbook on this um, because one really didn't exist. So we start with, you know, we've got four phases of the effort. We go through it. And the first is really understanding where you're at, what your current brand is, and what important equities of it that we need to roll forward um, into a new brand. And the big piece of that is getting the leadership involved in the rebranding process as well, too, because it's not just the marketer, it's not just right. even the CEO, but it has to be the leadership of the organization. And a lot of times we start out doing a lot of kind of basic brand education. What is a brand? How does it work on your behalf? What does it do to differentiate you? So that that leadership team now are we kind of becoming brand champions so that they're eager now to get the new brand when it's defined. So then we go through that whole process of really diving into their minds and their customers' minds and stakeholders in terms of what that new brand should be, defining it from what's the new customer promise and positioning, what names then illustrate that, what kind of visual representation does it, what's the new customer experience that we want to be introducing to our customers and standing up that new brand. And then we go through a really challenging piece of it, which is called trademarking, <laughs> because coming from the legal background, you'll know it's tough to get a name yeah. trademarked, you know, yep. and you really need to rely upon that trademark attorney to be able to give a high confidence that the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office is going to approve your submission because it can take up to a year to get a yep. trademark. Approved. I've just gone through it myself. Yeah. And it got stretched out during the pandemic even. So, right. you know, most people don't start this journey and then want to wait a year to get it done. So they have to make a decision on a name and, a, and on a trademark submission that there's a super high level of confidence is going to get approved because then you need to start doing all the background work to get it ready while you're waiting for that trademark approval. Um, so then you go through that whole process of updating all the internal documents and the web, you know, website and having everything ready to go, having your leadership be prepped on how to deliver the new brand story, your employees understanding what it is, and then ready to launch it on the final day and activating it out into the marketplace. Um, and that that's a you know very kind of intricate process as well, too, making sure that any super close kind of influentials that you need to let know a little in advance of others because they're going to influence how others feel about it, that you've teed it up to them, you've got their buy-in, and then you go public with it and everybody starts to receive the communications about what your new brand is, and then you market that going forward. Now, I think you've kind of already answered this, but I'm going to ask it this way. So how do you ensure the new brand accurately reflects the values and goals of the company? Oh, that's good. Your research up front and everything that you've learned from your internal stakeholders and from your customers that you've, you've probed and asked questions to really get to that heart of what that brand is, you then articulate it in a very short 
crisp, concise promise. And it's getting everyone to understand, does that work? Does that work for you? And oftentimes you bounce it off of a few customers that you've got a close relationship with to get their reaction to it. But it's a process of really putting it out there, fine tuning it, making sure everybody's comfortable with that. And indeed it does connect to the values, to the mission of the organization, you know, before you go forward. In fact, we, what often happens, and I tell people this as we start the process and they don't believe me, but once we get to that expression of the the new promise, they oftentimes will say, oh, we've got to add some more to our values, or we have to update our values or our mission statement now, because what we've landed on is so perfect and is so, you know, Mm -hmm. forward facing to move us ahead we need to update those as well too. So we'll go back and go through a process of kind of workshopping those to make sure everything is in alignment before we start to move forward. So how do you approach rebranding from a marketing perspective? What tactics do you use to get the word out? So when when it comes time to actually launch the new brand, um, you know, there's a very kind of important cadence of communications that we've learned over the years is important to follow. And it starts with giving your customers a little bit of a heads up that you're going to be going through this process so that you don't take them by surprise, that they know that you're studying the brand and they know that there's a chance that the name is going to change and that you've told them why it's important to your business going forward to make this change. You want to get that kind of, you know, acknowledgement or or acceptance that there's a reason for you to be rebranding before you tell them what the new brand is, because you don't want to be, you know, having to go back and revisit that. You want to get that education up front, then tell them what the new brand is, and then take time through all your different marketing platforms um, to explain the new name, what it stands for, what it means to them, what's going to be different for customers, what's the new promise that you're making using all those traditional, you know, direct communications from your sales team, um, you know, to all your social, to your, you know, web presence, to your, any kind of advertising, paid social that you're using, take time to tell the story. You don't need to rush it out right away. Take your time to bring a lot of dimension to it that makes it interesting to people. Do you recommend like a chief brand officer or a, like a, a position that is focused 100% on just making sure that the brand is exercised? Well, someone needs to have that responsibility, whether it's whether it's that title and 100% of their responsibility or someone within the organization needs to be the cop <laughs> to make right. sure that the new brand is communicated consistently across all these different platforms. And then to make sure that the employees are delivering the same brand story and everything that they do, that your customer service reps are telling the right story and responding with the right behaviors that might be di- different now than what they were prior to the rebrand. So it's it's really an internal and external kind of responsibility, not just to the customers. Yeah. Can you give me an example of a successful rebranding project you've worked on in the past? So we we had a great one that um, we're especially proud of. It was working with a professional service firm based here in Chicago that focuses on that kind of talent management um, sector of leadership engagement. So they coach leaders and leadership teams on how to best utilize your people to achieve your business results that you want. It was part of a French global firm called BPI, which were the initials of the French man that founded the firm years ago. So it went by the name BPI Group. And interestingly enough, that means nothing to anybody. Right. You know, just had no value. So there, there, there you go with the, you know, the, the name not having any value to anybody. It was just, that's the name of the firm. The management of the U.S. organization bought out their rights to run it in the U.S. And so this management buyout required a rebranding. And it, it wasn't just as simple as, well, let's just come up with a new name and put it on, on the firm, but let's go back and look at what we want our brand to be, what we want it to stand for, 
how we want to be understood by leaders of companies that are going to be hiring us to coach them on their people issues. And so we spent a lot of time really kind of defining what was the outcome of the work that they did. And they felt that as a result of working with them, that they created bolder futures for the executives that were leading the companies that they coached, the leadership teams, and the organizations as a whole. So they kind of ignited bold futures with their clients. And so that was their big aspirational statement. Then we started looking at names that would help kind of present that concept. We were looking at brave and bravada as words that, you know, because they gave bravery to the leaders that they coached. But we also wanted it to be a strong kind of call to action. And a word that kept on popping up and was stayed on the table for a long time was avanti, which is a Italian phrase for go forward, let's go. And kind of, a you know, let's get moving on this. So we looked at ways that we could kind of combine the two and came up with the term bravanti, meaning go courageously forward to create bold futures. The great thing about it is bravanti was a rarely used word. So trademarking was much easier on it. So that was one of their their goals was, you know, something that they could quickly get through the trademarking process. And so bravanti really crystallized for them in a very unique way this this kind of call to action that they were saying is what they deliver in the outcome of working with them, creating bold futures. And then we created a visual identity for that, which was a lot of you know bold colors and imagery. So the website and all the materials were updated to reflect this kind of um, look. The logo crystallized it with an arrow that was very colorful, you know, moving forward, courageously forward. They had a phenomenal response to with, within their current customer base and prospects that they have been courting for a long time of giving them another chance to talk about their capabilities and the way that they were uniquely guiding executives, especially through the pandemic, where the, you know, the requirements of leaders changed dramatically as a result of the pandemic. And the best part of it all is that their cross-selling of their different services, which often went to different individuals within a corporate organization, dramatically improved because they saw them as a partner that could lead on all these different fronts going forward. So they had some phenomenal growth numbers as a result of it and really felt that the rebranding helped accomplish that. So that's good. That That is very cool. How do you measure the success? You you look at all the traditional brand kind of impact measures, and then you look at sales and revenue. Because if it doesn't result in growth for the organization, it's not achieving its end goal. Rebranding is you would you you invest the time and the effort and the resources to rebrand because you want a better outcome. And that's growth. And so looking at how they grew in terms of the, the the number of engagements, the value of the engagements, the length of customer, you know, time and so forth, uh, lifespan was was ways that they can measure that. Good. So big mistakes, Jim. Well, I think the biggest mistake is people underestimate rebranding. Uh, they underestimate, you know, what right. it is and what it can accomplish and how and how much effort it takes to truly do it right, you know, and and to make it successful. Then you've got, you know, we see in the news every day, the mistake that a lot of companies make that they don't do the legal work and they don't, you know, make sure that they're going to be in a trademark protected brand name. And then they find themselves having to go back afterwards and change it. So getting that legal perspective is, is extremely important. And then I think being aspirational or not being aspirational enough. And, you know, if you're going to change up your organization and the name of it and the way you go to market, do it in a way that's bold and exciting and really gets people's attention and can last for years to come. Don't come up with a short-term solution. Come up with one that's going to work hard for you for years to come. Who are some of your mentors in this business? Well, my mentors. So I, I, what I try to do is pull interesting things from all these different, you know, people that I've worked with and that I see um, uh, out there in the marketplace. I love Simon Sinek, you know. Yeah, yeah, of course. The simplicity, you right. know, 
of, of his view, I think is great. So try to uh, try to pull in pieces, you know, from what he does and from many others to, to be inspiration. I'd love to get him on the podcast. Yeah. And speaking of podcasts, and I appreciate you being on ours. What other podcasts do you watch, listen to? I, you know, the, the podcasts that I tend to listen to are ones that are kind of take me away from work right? <laughs> and whether it's the, you know, the kind of current um, cultural issues or, you know, occasionally a good crime scene, you know, uh, solving kind of one or fun, just to, just to give your brain a relief from the day-to-day -day work. Is there any book that you could recommend to us or? I, you know, the books that I read, I read a lot of news just so that I can be very current right. um, on what is happening that might be not only just interesting conversation with a friend, but also with business. You know, I'm certainly something that's dominating everything right now is this whole AI right. issue. AI. Uh, yeah, what the impact will be on that and how it's being used and so forth, which interestingly enough, I think we need to look at AI as yet another tool. Yep. that's available to us don't feel like it's going to run you right over and you know no, we use it but how do you use it when is it when's appropriate to use it and how do you make sure that the human element remains in the piece of it all yep um the books i read tend to be uh, mostly about how do you um how do you build your business when you're in the 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 kind of line of work that we are traction is a is a, a great book yeah yeah it's one that i just read recently I got that right here. There you go. <laughs> yep, EOS. Perfect. Right there. My dog ate part of it, and that's <laughs> the truth. Well, Jim, it has been fantastic having you on my podcast, The World of Marketing. I appreciate your time and you explaining the rebranding process. And remind us again of their website URL. So rebrandingexperts.com. Keep it pretty simple. Same thing on all the social platforms. Rebrandingexperts.com. It is, that is a great brand, right? <laughs> Fantastic. Jim, thank you so much. Appreciate you. Thank you, everybody. Have a fantastic day.